Hello everybody. I think I'm live. I hope you can hear me okay. Please let me know if you can. I can see there's a couple of people in the chat already. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Welcome back. We also have someone called Hye Jung. Welcome. And So Hyun, and it seems that you've subscribed to our channel recently. Brilliant. Thank you for joining us. Um, and yes, you are on time. Don't worry. Here we are. We're starting now. Hello to Sun Young. I hope you're okay. I haven't seen you in ages. How are you? 123 says, I am live. Brilliant. I'm glad to hear that. I've had to change rooms today. Uh, because I was having trouble with my internet in my usual room. So my background is a little bit different, um, but at least the connection's good. I hope you're all okay. Um, we Did we have a live stream last week? Um, yes, we did have a live stream last week, Sun Young. Yeah. Um, I think. Yeah, we did. We did, exactly. We talked about British summertime expressions. Um and expressions related to the summer, basically. So check it out. It should be there on the um, on the channel, saved. Um, hello to Unsol, welcome. Hello to Leo and So Wu, welcome back. <laughs> Sun Yang said that she missed it. Oh, you'll have to watch the recorded version. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, hello to Sigo. My nickname in English is I am still working. Uh huh. <laughs> Sigo Trabajando. Uh huh. Where are you from, Sigo tra Trabajando? <laughs> um, hello to Silver Paper. Welcome back. Um, so, I have recently been in Malta. So, I went abroad uh, last week on Thursday. Um, so, at the moment, I am in quarantine. Uh, if you see someone in the background, that is my fiancé. <laughs> I'm sharing his office. Um, <laughs> he's not usually in my um, live streams, but today he's making an appearance. <laughs> um, hello to Chloe. Hello, how are you? And Sigur Trebahando is from Korea. Oh, okay. I thought you might be uh, in South America or something. <laughs> um... Sun Yang asks, is that, is that a computer, Twinkle Twinkle? Yes, it is, actually. My fiancé is a software developer, and he is obsessed with technology. And he made his own computer. And he's very proud of it. As you can see, it's got, like, rainbow colours in the background, which is pretty cool, I think. Leo says, handsome. Oh, I'll have to tell him. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm in quarantine at the moment, so I need to stay at home for 10 days because um, I've travelled back from abroad um, yesterday, actually. I got back last night. And according to the UK government, um, I well, anyone travelling abroad, back from abroad, back to the UK from abroad, would need to um, stay at home for 10 days. Um, we also have to do lots of tests. So I'm going to take a COVID test tomorrow. And then another one on day eight of when I'm in quarantine. I'm allowed to stay at home, of course. Um, I don't need to stay in a special quarantine hotel. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not meant to leave the house for 10 days. Boring, right? But it's kind of rainy here anyway, so I don't really want to go outside and enjoy the sunshine. Um... So, yeah, last time we talked about British summertime expressions, but this, this um, weather over here has become kind of autumny, autumnal rather, um, because it's now rainy, a little bit gloomy, um, and I'm hoping for the summer weather to come back soon. Yeah. Um, so I hope you're all good and looking forward to this live stream today. Now, we're going to be talking about animal idioms. Um, there are lots of idioms in English related to wildlife and animals. Um, the reason I chose this, actually, is because I have some news 
Um, recently, um, we got two new additions to our household. Um, two baby cats, two kittens. So I'm now the proud owner of um, two lovely little um, fluffy kittens. I don't know if we have any animal lovers in the house here. Um, let me know if you are fans of animals um, or cats. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I've never really been a cat person. But um, when I saw them, I fell in love, I must say, because they are super cute. I wish I could show them to you, but they are sleeping at the moment under the sofa, which is their favorite place to sleep. So do you guys have any pets? Let me know if you do, or if you love animals or not. And um, Sun Young is surprised <laughs> about my kittens. So we said it sounds lovely. Oh, yeah, maybe one time I'll be able to show you them when they're not sleeping. But they are very cute. Yeah. You are a fan of cats, Sun Young, that's nice. <laughs> they're lovely. So I thought because of this news, um, I would talk to you about animal idioms. So I'm going to share my screen as usual. Here we go. I'm just going to, here we go. Yeah. So that should be the one. All right. So let me know if you can see this. Hopefully you can. Um, I'm just waiting to see if there's anyone else who wants to join us before we get to the main part of this live stream, which is the animal idioms here to improve your English conversation. Uh, so we says, I have a cat. He's really cute and clever. Oh, yeah, they are really clever, aren't they? Yeah. And it's and they're very curious. In fact, another idiom, which I wasn't going to teach you today, but you just made me think of it, is curiosity killed the cat. This is an expression that we use. Um, it basically means like, if you're too curious, then sometimes you might get in trouble. Just like a cat, um, if it's too curious, it might go somewhere dangerous, I suppose, or do something dangerous um, because they want to find out what's going on or what something is. So we often say curiosity killed the cat, which is a sad one, but, um, yeah, that's an expression we use with cats. Yeah. Chloe said, I'd like to have a pet someday. What sort of pet would you like to have, Chloe? Hello to SY, welcome back. And hello to Amber's Little Forest. I love your nickname. And you love animals, brilliant. Okay, so you might uh, find this interesting. I've got some animal pictures to show you as well today. Um, so let's get to the first one, um, but before we do, I have a little pre-quiz question for you, as per usual. Uh, so here we go. Right, so as usual, the answer to this idiom you will find out at the end of the stream, okay? And here we go. The question is, which type of bird in the UK does the Queen legally own? So I'm talking about the Queen of um, England, Queen Elizabeth. Um, so which type of bird does she legally own? And you've got three options, and I'd like you to think about which one you think it is. These are the three options here. It could be swans, or peacocks, or doves. So, just in case you're not sure which um, birds these are, swans are the kind of like white ones with the long neck that you can see in water. Uh, peacocks are the ones which are like full of colour, basically, like blue, green, etc. So they're like really beautiful feathers. And doves are like white um, birds that fly and they symbolize peace um, in most cultures, I believe, yeah. So yeah, some of you are already writing in some answers about which one you think it is, but I will let you know at the end of the stream, so um, you'll have to wait until then to find out the correct answer. But good tries, guys. 
keep thinking about it and we'll come back to it later. In the meantime, let's start with our idioms. So we've got eight idioms to get on with about animals. So let's start with number one. As usual, if you have any questions, comments, anything, please ask me in the chat. So here we go, number one. What I would like you to do is try and guess the missing words. I've given you a picture to help you. You might be able to get the first one quite easily from the picture, the first word, but what do you think the second word is that's blanked out there? So what do you think this idiom is, the m in the m? Any ideas what the full idiom is over here? Let me know in the chat. Just going to wait to see if any of you have an answer. Over the Moon says, the elephant in the room, and so does Amber's little forest. Well done, guys. That is totally right. The answer is the elephant in the room. Well done. So, does anybody know when we use this expression, the elephant in the room? When do we say that? Um, what sort of situation might you use this expression? Does anybody have an idea? This is the full idiom. If you have an idea, just let me know in the chat um, over there. Just give it a try. Sanyang says it sounds negatively. Mm, okay. Kind of, yeah, I guess, yeah, it does kind of have a negative connotation, I suppose. One, two, three says, when you see something you can't avoid. Um, very, very close, very, very close. It's not exactly seeing something, but it's kind of something that you can't avoid. You're right, well done, yeah. Mm -hmm. Over the moon is nearly there. Over the moon says, we know it needs to be discussed, but... Very good. So you're kind of on the right track, guys, some of you. Um, I'll give you the explanation I've written here. And this is basically an expression we use when there is an obvious, a very clear problem or a clear situation, like difficult situation, but people don't want to talk about it. Okay, so it's like having an elephant in the room. It's like unavoidable, of course. If there was an elephant in the room, like in the picture I just showed you, um, nobody would be able to avoid that elephant, right? Um, so, yeah, this is an obvious problem, something that's clearly a problem or clearly difficult, but nobody wants to talk about it. So everybody is trying to avoid talking about that thing, basically. Okay. I'm just going to adjust the screen so that you can see um, everything a bit more clearly. Okay, I think that might be better, there we go. All right, lovely. So well done, guys. Um, Amber said that Flora has explained it in her live. Oh, there you go. Okay, so she's already explained it to you. Don't forget, Flora's live stream is every Friday, my colleague. Um, she does a live stream as well, which is very useful for your English, so please join her. I'm here every Tuesday, and she's um, here every Friday. So, um, let's have a look at a couple of examples. So, have a look at this situation here. So, um, in this situation, my brother sat down for dinner with a black eye. So, when I say black eye, it's like somebody's punched him or something's happened to his eye. So, he's, his eye is bruised. He didn't want to tell us what happened. So, there was an elephant in the room for the duration of dinner. So, yeah, you're kind of basically saying that... Um, Something happened, but he didn't want to tell us. But it was so clear that something had happened because we could see his black eye. So that was kind of like the elephant in the room. Um, so the whole dinner, people were just constantly not talking about this thing, even though they were curious as to what happened, I suppose. 
So yeah, one, two, three. Maybe he fought with someone, um, but because he didn't want to tell us, it, there was an elephant in the room. There was like a point of discussion that never happened. No. Um, so that's a good one. I think I have another example here as well. Let me just check. Yeah, here we go. And in fact, I've underlined the verb because it's often used with this idiom. So if you look at this one, the verb address. So I think we should address the elephant in the room and discuss what to do about selling the house. Okay, so if you address the elephant in the room, this means that you actually talk about the problem that people don't want to talk about. Okay, so you are actually confronting the problem in this case. Okay. So, um, yeah, it often goes with that. Shall we address the elephant in the room? Shall we talk about that difficult or uncomfortable subject? So I hope that this has been clear. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And do you say this in your own language as well? Like, um, do you have an expression exactly the same in your languages? Or is it completely different? Let me know in the chat if you have any questions or comments about this um, before I go on to number two. Okay, I can't see any more comments in the chat, so I will move on to number two. But again, let me know if you do have any questions about anything. So here we go, number two. Another picture for you of this bird. Um, again, I'd like you to try and fill in the gaps. What do you think um, the missing words are here about this bird? Let me know in the chat if you have any ideas. Okay, I'm not getting anything in the chat, so I'm just going to check that the chat is working because sometimes it can be a bit strange, unless you're being extremely quiet, of course, but I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay, Sun Young has commented, he it said it's hard to explain in Korean, I think there's no word. Mm, okay, all right, fair enough. All right, so does anyone know what this bird is, first of all, in this picture? Uh, in Seoul says there's a similar expression in Korea. People in Korea often say the way to put an elephant in the fridge when they talk about a problem that seems to be almost impossible to solve. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? Um, if it's difficult to solve, it's difficult to put it in the fridge, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, Amber's Little Forest says, turkey, well done. Yes, that is the correct word. Does anyone know the expression though? So to quit mm, turkey, what's the first word? Does anyone know what it could be? I'll give you a clue. So this turkey is in the snow. So how do you think the turkey is feeling? Very good, Sun Young, if that's correct. Yeah, the answer is cold. Yes, very good. So the expression is to quit cold turkey. I'll show you the full idiom. We often say cold turkey or we use it with the verb to quit. So if you quit something, cold turkey, does anyone know what this means? Let me know in the chat if you have any um, ideas about this. So I'll give you an example. You could say, my dad decided to quit smoking cold turkey. Any idea what that means? Have you heard it before, perhaps? This is a very common expression with quit. Okay, so some of you are wondering about it, wondering if it's about Thanksgiving, about food, not quite sure. Okay. All right, let me show you the example. 
and the definition. So it basically means to quit something suddenly and completely. Okay, so it's not a gradual change. It's not slowly quitting. It's quitting from one day to the next. Um, for example, he decided to stop smoking and quit cold turkey. So this means he gave up smoking from one day to the next. So one day he was smoking, the next day he wasn't smoking at all. Okay, so we use this expression cold turkey to show this. <laughs> Sunny is asking, why Turkey? I'm not sure, to be honest. I can't answer that question. <laughs> I'm sure there must be some sort of um, kind of historical reason for that, uh, as there are with most idioms, to be honest. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We'd have to Google that one. Um, <laughs> somebody here has said, so interesting expression. It is an interesting expression, and it is used quite often as well. In fact, I would say the ones I've chosen for today are all used in everyday language quite often. Um, but this is really useful because if you talk about a habit that you stop doing um, very quickly without any, without gradually, you know, um, changing. So it's literally one day you're doing it, the next day you're not. You can say that you quit cold turkey. Yeah, it's a funny expression. So hopefully you'll remember it, right? Okay, um, so let's have a look at number three. Here we have another animal picture. What do you think is happening here and what are the missing words? Do the mm mm. So it's two words that are missing. One of them is the animal in the picture. Let me know if you have any idea what this expression could mean. The picture might help you a little bit. Very good silver paper. The answer is donkey. The first gap is donkey. D-O-N-K-E-Y. Uh, but the next word is not move. What do you think it could be? Do the donkey. Mm. Donkeys are well known, at least in Europe, for doing lots of things to help humans. Uh, Chloe, you're really close. It's not job. It's another word related to that, but it's not actually job. But you're really close. Very good, Sun Young. Do the donkey work. Well done. That is correct. To do the donkey work. That's it. Very good, guys. Some of you have also suggested work. Fantastic. Do the donkey work. So, doing the donkey work. Mm, what do you think it means if you do the donkey work? Does anyone have any ideas? Let me know in the chat if you have any suggestions about what this means and when we use it. It's, I'll give you a clue, it's not something good, it's something kind of has a negative connotation. Um, one, two, three says hard work. Yes, yes, very good. Uh, Usik says not lazy. Mm, not exactly that one. Silver paper says be productive. Mm, not exactly. Sun Young, I think you're on the right track. Um, over the moon, do the simple manual work. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. So it's usually the kind of work that nobody wants to do. So it basically means, if you look at the example, to do the hard or boring part of a job. Okay, so maybe you have a job to do, but there are different parts to the job. And if you do the donkey work, you're the one who is doing the boring part of that job. For example, why should I do all the donkey work whilst you sit around doing nothing? So that's a perfect example of how you could use it in conversation do the donkey work. Um, so you might use this, for example, if you start at a company, so if you're new at a company, um, often when you start, you're not really doing the interesting parts of the job. You're kind of doing the kind of maybe repetitive, simple jobs that nobody wants to do. 
<clears throat> like filing or photocopying or I don't know stuff like that so you might think that you're doing the donkey work perhaps um, do you say this in your own languages do you say do the donkey work let me know if you have a similar expression Chloe said nobody wants to do the donkey work that is very true exactly <laughs> Um, Sun Yang says there are times when simple labor is good that doesn't cause a big problem I've been feeling it lately <laughs> I totally understand what you mean yes sometimes it's nice to do the donkey work because you're not having to um, have so much responsibility I suppose which could affect things yeah okay well done guys so we have a few more to get through so I'm going to move on to number four which is the middle of our list of eight here we go now this one might be a bit more tricky I'm not sure if you'd be familiar with it but um, the picture will give you the animal that you need and the first gap is an adjective so a uh, mm, kettle of mm. Any idea what expression this is? Let me know. Just give it a try. What do you think it could be? Usyk says somebody need to do the donkey work for society. Yes, that is very true, Usyk. Somebody does need to do the donkey work. Yeah, there's always someone who needs to do it. Okay, Sanyang has suggested fish. Very good. That's the second gap. So a uh, mm, kettle of fish. What do you think the first word could be? This is an adjective. Chris, you got it. Well done. A different kettle of fish. Well done. That is fantastic. This is the full idiom. A different kettle of fish. Now, this one is a little bit tricky. It might not be as, um, you, you may not be as familiar with it as the other ones. Um, the meaning of this, I will show you. So this means to be completely different from something or someone else. Okay. So if you're comparing two things or two people, you could say that they are a different kettle of fish if they are completely different. For example, Take a look at this one. So on this page we have having knowledge is one thing, but being able to communicate it to others is a different kettle of fish. This is a good one. Um, it reminds me of a professor that I had at my university many, many years ago. <laughs> um, I remember he was an expert at um, his subject. Um, he was an expert at film, so he knew everything about film, about film um, criticism, film language, like all about films. However, he wasn't that good at communicating his knowledge, his experience to us as students. So he didn't really, even though he was really knowledgeable, he couldn't really communicate it to us very well. Um, so I thought this one was a good one because they are completely different things. Yeah, being able to communicate it is a different kettle of fish. So I hope that makes sense, that expression. Um, but I will show you another one just in case um, you need a little further uh, explanation. Here we go. So, asking to stay with a friend for a few days is one thing, but for a few months is a different kettle of fish. Okay, so in this case, you're basically saying that those two requests are completely different um, from each other. Okay, it's okay to ask to stay with your friend for a few days, but to stay for a few months is quite a different thing. It's a different kettle of fish. Okay, so I hope that makes it a little clearer. This is how we would normally use it in British English. Let me know if you have any questions about this or comments. Um, some of you said, good example. Mm -hmm. Great, I'm glad. Um, 
Over the Moon has an example of their own. So reading books is one thing, but being able to put into action is a different kettle of fish. Yes, you could say maybe um, a story in a book is one thing, but a story in a film is a different kettle of fish. Because you know sometimes when you read a book, the film version is not good in comparison. <laughs> Then perhaps you could use it that way. Yeah. Well done, guys. Very good. Okay, we're going to move on to the next idiom with another bird. Have a look at number five. And in this one, you just need to tell me what bird this is, if you have any idea. So the expression is to watch someone like a... Mm. Any idea what bird this is? One, two, three has suggested eagle. Um, it's not actually an eagle, but it's kind of in the same sort of family because it's one of those um, big birds. Um, but one, two, three has actually got it. The answer is hawk. To watch someone like a hawk. That's what we say. Well done, one, two, three. I'll show you the full expression, guys. Here we go. To watch someone like a hawk. So this bird is a hawk. Um, It's a bird of prey, like an eagle is. It's one of those massive ones. <laughs> Obviously, they have amazing eyesight. Um, and they can spot things from very far away. So if you watch someone like a hawk, it basically means to watch someone very carefully. Okay, so you could say the shopkeeper watches those teenagers like a hawk. Whenever they come in. Why do you think the shopkeeper watches those teenagers like a hawk? Any idea why a shopkeeper might do that? Sun Yang says, reminds me of the Avengers hawk eye. Ah, there you go. Yes, because they are supposed to have amazing eyesight. That's them. I wish I had eyes like a hawk. <laughs> Uh, Chloe has suggested they might steal something. Yeah, it could be. Unfortunately, teenagers sometimes have, like groups of teenagers sometimes have the, um, well, the stereotype is that they might try and steal something from the shop. Perhaps, yeah. Exactly, guys, yeah. So, this shopkeeper is obviously protecting him, his shop by making sure that he's watching them really carefully whenever they come into his shop. And I don't blame him, to be honest. Yeah. Sonia said, is she trying to make sure they're not hurt? Um, maybe, maybe. Um, but I would assume the shopkeeper is probably checking that they don't do anything they shouldn't do. Yeah. So you seem to have a similar expression in Korea, Amber? Very interesting, yeah. If you have a similar one in your own language, then it can be... Um, It can be easy, basically. You just need to translate. <laughs> well done, guys. Well done. So we're going to move on to number six in our list. Um, here we have a fish. So we've got the animal picture, but what has happened to this fish? Where is it? The expression is a fish out of... Mm. What is it out of? Does anybody know? Let me know in the chat what you think. That could be. Well done, guys. You're getting it all right. Correct. S-Y, you said water. Silver paper, water. Yeah, a fish out of water. Exactly. Well done, guys. Yeah, you've got it right. So we often say that you feel like a fish out of water. Or you could also say to be like a fish out of water. Any idea how you would feel if you felt like a fish out of water? Does anybody know what, like how we, we, we would use that? What sort of feeling is it? Let me know if you have any ideas. U6 says, hard to endure about something. Um, kind of, yeah, it definitely means that you're in a difficult situation. Um, Over the Moon says, a person who don't fit in new environment. Yes, exactly. That, that's a bit of a better explanation. Yeah. 
you feel bad. So who says unfamiliar place or situation? Very good. Yeah. So if you're in a place that is unfamiliar to you, you don't feel comfortable, um, or a situation, um, as Chris has said here, then yes, you feel like a fish out of water. I've got a couple of examples for you, but this is my explanation. So not feel comfortable or relaxed because you're in an unusual or unfamiliar situation. Like a fish out of water, obviously, would not feel comfortable. So some examples, you could say, if he wasn't married, he would feel like a fish out of water. So maybe this guy has been married for a long time. He feels very comfortable and good being married. And if he wasn't married, so imagining he wasn't married, he would feel like a fish out of water. He would feel like uh, you know, like uncomfortable and in an unfamiliar territory, I guess. And the second one, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate to if you've changed jobs. Uh, when I changed jobs, I felt like a fish out of water. So perhaps you were starting in a new industry, uh, lots of new people, new place. So maybe you felt like a fish out of water at the beginning, perhaps. You could use it in this way. Okay. So hopefully that has made it clear. Let me know if you have any questions, any comments about this um, before we move on. It's not really a feeling of being unsafe. It's not really about safety, uh, even though it might seem that way because obviously a fish would die if it was out of water. Uh, but it's more just a feeling of being uncomfortable or not used to the situation, basically. Okay, it's clear? Brilliant. Yeah. All right, so let's go on to number seven. So we're on the penultimate idiom. Here we have another picture. I'm not sure if you can see what's going on, but this is an expression, a wild goose something. Any idea what the missing word is over there? This is this picture here. This is a goose. The um, kind of like <laughs> the swan's ugly sister, I suppose. <laughs> Any idea what what the missing word is? So who has actually given us the right answer already? Well done. The answer is chase. A wild goose chase. Very good. Very good. And Chris has written it as well. Fantastic. So this is the expression. We often use it in this way. We say to send somebody on a wild goose chase. Um, <laughs> this might be a bit of a funny one um, to understand. It might not be so clear from, from the expression. But basically the meaning is this. So search. So we, we use it for searching. A search that is com a complete waste of time because the person or the thing being searched for does not exist or is somewhere else. So if you send someone on a wild goose chase, you're basically asking them or sending them to do something, like to find something, but that thing that they're trying to find is not there or does not exist. So of course, it's like chasing a wild goose because it's, you know, it's impossible to catch that goose. Yeah, I've noticed that I've written good chase here. I think that's a complete typo. It should be goose. So G-O-O-S-E. Yeah, goose chase. So let me give you an example. Here we go. After two hours spent wandering in the snow, I realized we were on a wild goose chase. So basically, maybe we were looking for something in the snow, we'd been looking for this thing or this place for two hours, walking around, and then we realised that, you know, we were on a wild goose chase. We were on a search which would never um, actually kind of have an answer. Does that make sense? Let me know if... Um, if that expression makes sense, okay? So yeah, if some, if 
you know, somebody asks you to go and get them something or buy them something, but they can't find it in any of the shops or anywhere, they come back and say, oh, you sent me on a wild goose chase. That's it. All for nothing. Yeah, exactly. So it's all of that for nothing. Sanyang says, I like this expression. Me too. I think it's really accurate. <laughs> Well done. Okay, so guys, we have one more to go in our list. Number eight, the final idiom. Here we go. Drum roll, please. Trrr. Our final idiom is this one. And we have our little, tiny little animal here, a fly. Um, what do you think the missing word is here? Wouldn't mm, a fly. Sunning says, I was in line at a famous restaurant during lunchtime, but I couldn't eat while waiting in line. It's a wild goose chase. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So you were in line and you never managed to get into the restaurant in the time you had. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Okay, some of you are suggesting things. We haven't had the correct answer yet, though. Good, good try, Yusik, but that's not it. Um, so, well done. The answer is hurt. Wouldn't hurt a fly. Chris, you were close with kill, but not kill. It would be wouldn't hurt. So the expression is he or she wouldn't hurt a fly. So we use it to describe people. He wouldn't hurt a fly. What do you think this means? Any ideas what it means if you say somebody wouldn't hurt a fly? Let me know if you have any suggestions about this. So who says a timid person? Yes, this person could be timid, yeah. Or kind, well done, one, two, three. Yeah, I would probably go more with the kind part, yeah. Um, so somebody is very kind. Sun Yang says, is he coward? Mm, no, we don't use it in a negative way because a coward is somebody who's afraid of everything. So it's a negative word, so we wouldn't use it for that. This is more for somebody who is gentle and nice and wouldn't offend anyone or hurt anyone. Exactly. So Chris says the person is not offensive. Exactly, yeah. So my explanation here is somebody gentle who would not do anything to injure or offend anyone, basically. Okay, so we often use this expression to describe somebody kind and gentle like this. For example, you could say, I can't believe that John got into a fight. He wouldn't hurt a fly. So maybe this guy, John, your friend, normally he's, you know, he doesn't have that kind of character. He's really gentle, really sweet. So I can't believe he got into a fight because normally he wouldn't hurt a fly. Or the other expression, that dog looks big and dangerous, but it wouldn't hurt a fly. So it looks aggressive, but it wouldn't hurt you. It wouldn't harm you in any way. So you can use it this way. Let me know if that's clear or if you have any questions about it. Um, but those are all of the eight idioms I wanted to show you today, guys. Um, we're now going to move on to the mini quiz, which we usually do at the end of the stream. So I hope you're ready for that. It's a kind of trivia quiz about, um, well, about animals, basically. <laughs> Over the Moon says, we usually say the person who can live without any law in Korea. Ah, oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, because that person doesn't need a law, right? Because they are already very respectful. Yeah, nice one. I like it. Okay, some of you are saying you're ready for the quiz. Brilliant. So before we do the mini quiz, we obviously had the pre-quiz, didn't we, before, where I asked you about the queen and the birds. And I ask you, which type of bird in the UK does the Queen legally own? So some of you were giving me answers earlier. Does anyone want to try and give me another answer? 
We had three options. The first one was swan, second one was peacocks, and the third one was doves. Okay, some of you are saying different things. Swans, 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 doves, swan. It seems like most of you think it's swans, and in fact, you are correct. The answer was swans, yeah. So in fact, there are two types of swan in the UK, and one of those types of swans, which is the traditional swan that everybody knows, the white one with the long neck, which you can see on lots of lakes and things in, around London, um, those ones, they're called mute swans, M-U-T-E. Um, they are legally owned by the, by the queen, basically. Um, so if you killed one of those swans or caught one of those swans, you would be in big trouble. So yeah, have a look online, you'll find some information about it, but I think it's really interesting to know that the Queen owns them. She also owns some other kinds of animals. Um, I can't think what they are now, but there's a few specific British animals that she she owns. Yeah. Um, Amber, Amber's Little Forest says, I heard that it's been used as a cooking ingredient for the queen. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Hopefully not. <laughs> I don't think she eats them. I think they're just protected. <laughs> okay, so moving on to our actual mini quiz. Here we go. Question number one. Mini quiz time. Here we go. First question. So, first question is, what breed is considered the national dog of England. The national dog of England. So is it A, Pitbull Terrier? Is it B, Bulldog? Or is it C, Labrador? As usual, write your answer in the chat. What do you think the answer is? A, B, or C? Okay, we've got a couple of answers coming in already. Let's just wait and see if anyone else has an answer. All right, so it seems like a mixed bag, but to me, on my screen at least, it looks like one, two, three was the first one to write the answer, the correct answer, which is B, well done, one, two, three. The answer is Bulldog. Fantastic. In fact, we call it a British Bulldog. Yeah, because we have French Bulldogs as well, don't we? But yeah, a British Bulldog. I will show you a picture. Here we go. This dog is considered the national dog of England. <laughs> so yeah, did you know that, guys? Have you heard that before? And do you have many of these dogs around your countries? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is it. Some of you are saying cute. <laughs> to be honest, I love dogs, so I like all dogs. Um, all dogs are really cute, in my opinion. Except maybe one or two that aren't that cute, but most of them, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's correct. Well done, one, two, three. Okay, here we go. Next question. What is the largest land animal in England? Is it A, the red deer, B, South Devon cow, or is it C, the English thoroughbred horse? Which one do you think it is? Let me know in the chat if it's A, B, or C. <laughs> Someone said it looks so sad. Yeah, it does look a bit. It has that kind of like downwards mouth, doesn't it? The bulldog. No. Chan says, how's it different to the French one? They look quite different, actually. Yeah, if you compare them, they do look, look different. Okay, so we've got some answers coming in. Mm, okay, it looks to me like Amber's Little Forest is the one who got it right first. Well done, Amber. The answer is red deer. A. <laughs> so it's actually the red deer um, stag, so it's the male one which is the largest land animal in England. I'll show you a picture. This is it. 
as you can see it's got massive antlers on the top yeah and yeah according to my research this is the largest land animal in in England yeah the red deer stag and there we go <laughs> well done guys Hello Sky, you're late. Oh, don't worry, you just caught us at the very end doing our usual mini quiz. <laughs> SY says Rudolph. Yeah, basically, yeah. It does look cool, doesn't it, Chan? Okay, final question of our of the day. Question three. Percentage. So what percentage of people own pets in the UK? What do you think it could be? Could it be A, 63%, B, 51%, or C, 45%? What do you think these days? This was uh, a study from 2020. Here we go. We've got some A, we've got a B, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, mixed, mixed bag, mixed bag. Okay, well, it looks like, from my calculations, that Bubble Tea is the winner here. Well done, Bubble Tea. Oops, sorry, I've gone too far. The answer is B, 51%. Very, very good. Very good. And um, if you were to guess which, <coughs> excuse me, which animal it is that people own the most, well done, Bubble Tea. The answer is dog. <laughs> Silver Paper says, I see a lot of people with dogs at the park. Yes, dog is number one. So if you look at this, which I screenshotted from a study, you'll see the blue picture is um, a dog. And you'll see all over the UK, the blue is um, the blue animal, which is the dog here. It has the highest percentage. Except for in London, where cats uh, dominate. So there's more cats, cat owners in London than dog owners. Probably because of the fact that it's all like, you know, built up. It might be a bit dangerous. Um, but yeah, mm. or not so easy to walk a dog, I suppose. Not so green. Um, but yeah, it seems like dogs are the number one, followed by cats most of the time in most parts of the UK. And there we go. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Well done. And thank you for participating in every part of this stream, especially the mini quiz. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Um, I will see you here next week. I'll be back again with a different stream. Same time. So it's 2 p.m. GMT every week. Um, tell your friends to join us and subscribe to this channel so that you'll get reminders every week um, for this uh, live stream lesson. Uh, take care, guys. Thank you again. You're very welcome. I'm glad you found it interesting, guys. Have a great week, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.